a very good evening to all of you i am murli dhar pai professor and head department of obstetrics and gynecology kasturba medical college manipal come july third weekend it's time for dr padma rao pg update and oration that's why we all have logged in here and i'm really thankful to all of you for that before we proceed i would like to brief some housekeeping rules i request everyone to please turn off your video and turn off your audio unless you are a speaker of the program that would help us in having the best of bandwidth and a smooth streaming of the videos thank you all for your cooperation Today's program is in two parts. The first part is a formal function wherein our honored speakers will be felicitated. Our new Vice Chancellor, Lieutenant General Dr. M. D. Venkatesh has kindly consented to be the chief guest of the function and our pro Vice Chancellor Health Sciences, Dr. P. L. N. G. Rao has agreed to be the guest of honor. The second part of the program is where we will have the lectures by today's guest speakers. Dr. Urmila Kovilam will be giving the oration on diabetes in pregnancy, ongoing challenges, and Professor Lucy Gilbert will be delivering guest lecture on improving outcomes in ovarian and endometrial cancers. As always, before we start the program, we would have the blessings of Madam. We offer our pronouns and floral tribute to our beloved Madam. It's been a tradition to invoke blessings. So now I request all professor ಕ್ಷಯ ಕರಿ ಯೋಗಾನಂದ ಕರಿ ಪುಕ್ಷಯ ಕರಿ ಧರ್ಮೈಕ ನಿಷ್ಠ ಕರಿ ಚಂದ್ರಾರ್ಕಾನಲ Thank you, Shamala. Now, I would like to give a brief about Madam Padma Rao and the background of the oration. If your actions inspire others to dream more, team more, and do more and become more, you are a leader, said John Quincy Adams. I think these words appropriately describe the leader who led and inspired all of us. Yes, I'm talking about our Madam Dr. A. Padma Rao. The mere fact that we are celebrating her life today, 35 years after her retirement, speaks volumes about her. Heading a well-running department is also not easy. Imagine daring to go to an unknown place with people speaking unknown language and starting a department from scratch that too in a newly started first private medical college of the country madam faced all the challenges and hardships over the next 30 years 
to ensure that the department met world standards. She had so many firsts to her credit. In addition to being the first HOD, she was the first to perform laparoscopic sterilization in India, first to conduct the ASOG as well as KSOJ conferences in Manipal. She was not only a splendid gynecologist, teacher of the highest order and administrator par excellence, she was a great human being. I have imbibed many good qualities from her. She was a true leader and was and has produced many leaders. After Madam's passing away in 2011, her family made an endowment and our beloved Chancellor, Dr. Ramdas M. Pai, added a matching grant for the purpose of awarding an oration in her name to be delivered by a senior professor who would also conduct ward rounds and case discussions for our PGs. We have had eight orations so far, and the previous orators were Dr. P.K. Sekaran from Calicut, Dr. V.P. Piley from Kochi, Dr. Deepika Deka from Delhi, Dr. Suchitra Pandit from Mumbai, Dr. Sarina Gilwas from Trishur, Dr. C. D. V. S. N. from Tiruvalla, Dr. Krishnendu Gupta from Kolkata, and Dr. M. G. Hiramat from Hubli last year. This year, being a special year, we had to conduct it online, and we thought we could widen the scope. So we are having an oration and a guest lecture this year. Happy to say that both these world-renowned obstetricians and gynecologists are our own alumni. Dr. Urmila Kovilam will deliver the oration and Professor Lucy Gilbert will deliver the guest lecture. Now I request our Dean to deliver the welcome address. Thank you, Dr. Murali Darpai. Dr. A. Padma Rao was synonym with maternal and child care. She was a visionary in maternal health in Udupi district. Dr. A. Padma Rao started the department of OBG in Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, and served in various posts, including the HOD of OBG for almost four decades. Her husband, Dr. A. Krishna Rao, was dean for the longest period of time of 22 years, starting from 1963 to 1985. The couple, together, their contribution to KMC is unsurpassable. It's my privilege to welcome the family members of Dr. A. Padma Rao, Dr. Shubha Gita, Dr. Girija, and Dr. Gauri, along with the children and grandchildren of Dr. A. Padma Rao. We have all gathered here today for the function arranged by the Department of OBG in honor of Dr. A. Padma Rao in the form of oration and invited lecture. For all the faculty who have gathered from KMC Manipal, Mangalore, obstetrics and gynecologists from Udupi district, Karnataka state, the alumni of department of OBG spread all over Karnataka and all over India. I welcome all of them for this function. Lieutenant General Dr. M. D. Venkatesh, he is our chief guest today. He is an alumnus of Mysore Medical College and ENT surgeon by profession. If my knowledge is correct, he has achieved the highest post in Indian Army any Army doctor can achieve. Seventh Vice Chancellor of Manipal Academy of Higher Education, I welcome you, sir. Dr. P. Lenji Rao, pediatric surgeon by profession, Pro Vice Chancellor of Health Sciences, is a guest of honor today. It's an honor to welcome you, sir. I also extend a respectable welcome to Dr. Urmila Kovilam, who will be giving the oration today, and Dr. Lucy Gilbert, who will be giving the invited lectures. And my warm welcome to all the postgraduate students who have joined KMC Manipal and KMC Mangalore. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Our pro chancellor, Dr. H. S. Parlal, has always supported us and encouraged us. He has made it a point to attend all the programs of the department, and I'm 
happy that today also he has logged in and he has sent this kind message. My warm greeting, our guest speakers and all those who are participating in this oration. I would particularly like to welcome our uh, new Vice Chancellor, Lieutenant General Dr. Venkatesh, who is participating in the university program for the first time after taking over as the Vice Chancellor. Padma Rao and her husband, Dr. A. Krishna Rao, came to Manipal in the year 1954 and, and she was the founder, head of the department of obstetrics and gynecology till the year 1985. As you all know, our uh, Kasturba Medical College Manipal, the first self-financing medical college to be started in this country way back in 1953. Padma Rao and her husband were the first few faculty members to come and join this prestigious medical college. She popularized maternity care in and around Udupi. She started uh, Rural Maternity and Child Welfare Homes, popularly known as RMCW Homes. That's why the maternal mortality and the infant mortality rates are very low, comparable to international standards here in Manipal. She was the first to start laparoscopic sterilization camp in India. She was a great teacher and an excellent orator. She used to go to Mangalore to participate in teaching programs as she was very much interested in academic activities till the clinical section started here in Manipal in the year 1970. She was our very close family friend because when they came to Manipal in the year 1954, there were no accommodation available at Manipal. That's why all these faculty members who joined Kasturba Medical College Manipal used to stay at Udupi and they were staying right in front of our house. In addition to her academic activities, she was involved very actively in the social and cultural activities. She was a very active member of Mahila Samaj of Udupi and my mother also was an active member of uh, Mahila Samaj Udupi. That's why they knew each other from very close quarters for a very long time from 1954. My two children were uh, born at Kasturba General Hospital, Manipal, under the supervision of uh, Dr. Padma Rao. She was my examiner of obstetrics and gynecology because I, at Government Medical College, Mysore, because I studied at Government Medical College, Mysore, like our Vice Chancellor, and her husband, Dr. A. Krishna Rao, who was a physiology professor of great repute. He was my examiner of physiology, again at uh, Government Medical College, Mysore. So I had a long relationship with this family right before I came to join Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore in the year 1971. I compliment the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology headed by our dynamic Dr. Murli Pai for making this oration which started way back in 2012, an annual event in memory of Dr. Padma Rao who was a legend in obstetrics and gynecology. Once again, I extend my warm greetings to our guest speakers as well as all those who are present in this meeting. Thank you very much for the opportunity given. Thank you very much for your encouraging words and sharing the memories with Madam and Professor Krishna Rao, sir. Professor A. Krishna Rao was former Dean of KMC Manipal and husband of Madam Padma Rao. He has attended all the previous orations and today also he has logged in for this oration. He has sent a message. Let's listen in. Friends, I congratulate all the speakers and organizers of this function today. The speakers and organization happen to be the not only the alumni but also leaders of various public opinion in the institution. And I do hope that in times to come, more and more of this type of organization will be done. And I do hope that this particular organization will be a prominent feature of the institution. 
Thank you, sir, for your message. Dr. Sujata Bhatt was a student of Madam Padma Rao. She's a consultant in Delhi now, and I request her to share her experiences during her studentship at Manipal with Madam Padma Rao. Over to Dr. Sujata Bhatt, you can unmute yourself and talk. Good evening, uh, Shubhagita. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be a participant in this very nostalgic event. I was very fortunate to be her student uh, in the late 70s and the early 80s. I'm so glad a lot has been already said about her 30 years in the field of OBG and as the HOD of OBG and as the stress on her great achievements in those 30 years about uh, her starting laparoscopy in South Canada. But I would like to stress on some aspects of the laparosco laparoscopy part. She was the first one to start it with a simplified technique using air as the pneumoperitoneum and doing it under local anesthesia and even designing these uh, tables for appropriate posture during the uh, laparoscopic uh, camps that we all went for. Now, it is said that she was trained in laparoscopy under Dr. Jeff Court, and when she came over to India, she did not have funds to buy a laparoscope. And it is said that she collected all her Kanjivaram saris, which, she were, which were gifted to her in various felicitation events, and sold them to buy her first laparoscope. So, uh, Apart from us joining her in these laparoscopic camps and learning about the basics of laparoscopy, she also started these rural, she was instrumental in starting the rural health centers, which already Dr. Balal has talked about. And uh, because of which she brought Manipal to the forefront because she brought down the maternal and neonatal, perinatal mortality rates remarkably. She also started CME programs at our, at our time. And we were uh, fortunate to listen to a lot of stalwarts at that time. Now, uh, regarding to her contribution to the FOXI, uh, as has already mentioned earlier, she started the, uh, she was the organizing chairperson of the eight, 18th uh, AICOG uh, conference, and she was also the senior vice president of FOXI in the year 78-79. She also organized the voluntary sterilization conference in 82 at Manipal, and she was an orator of a very interesting conference, the neglected contraceptive device, the IUCD. It is said that she actually went by boat to villages which were not accessible, went by boat and inserted IUCDs in women who needed them. She was a great orator and she was also, um, uh, she received a lot of oration awards and a lot of appreciation awards, both in Karnataka and outside the state. Uh, here she is receiving the Foxy Oration Award. Now everyone knows, um, uh, in, in, incidentally, she also received the Lifetime Achievement Award in 1999 at Lucknow. Now, everyone knows about how passionate she was about teaching and how strict and disciplined she was. She was very compassionate too. There were moments when she made us feel we were more like her children than her students. There was this incident where eight of us had to appear for our DGO practical exam and at the end hour, our center was changed to Mangalore instead of Manipal and we all were pretty nervous because we had to check into a hotel. The morning of the exam, we found Dr. Padmara outside our door with Prasadam. She actually drove down from Manipal to Mangalore, prayed for us at a temple and came to us with the Prasadam. She was very uh, dedicated to her patients, be it 3 a.m. in the morning or 3 p.m. in the afternoon, 24-7. She was there for us in the labor room if there was any complicated case. Now, uh, regarding the OT that was focused earlier by Dr. Murli, even our OT, this is not the Manipal OT, but even our OT was like this with a gallery on top where all of us used to look down and see the surgeries going on. There was this patient who had uh, several uh, missed abortions, I mean uh, miscarriages because of failed uh, circlages, vaginal circlages, and she came to Dr. Padmarao and said Padmarao was her only hope to have a child. Now, remember, we were in the days of sans Google, sans guidelines, but yet Dr. Padmarao was a walking encyclopedia. She immediately recalled that there were a few cases which were reported about abdominal and circlage. So she quickly looked up the procedure, gave us all pamphlets on the steps of the procedure, and actually did an abdominal and circlage on this patient, kept her in the free ward till the ninth month, and sent her home with a baby. 
So her approach to patients too was very empathetic. Now, apart from all her work, she even uh, loved to participate in uh, functions as already mentioned by Dr. Balal. And she loved to accompany the students along with them, attend conferences and go with them, be it a bus or a train, but join in all the fun along with, her, with us. And mind you, we also enjoyed her company immensely. And as you can see in the pictures ahead, you can see her participating in various cultural events, be it a dance or a skit, she was there. And uh, she was full of fun and laughter. And even till the age of 80, you can see her in the laughing club uh, at Manipal. Now, um, it is said that the, uh, uh, the teachings, the influence of a great teacher can never be erased. Now, there's one thing that's always in my mind, and that is how to deliver a good lecture. Those days, we had the overhead projector, but it's equivalent to our slides now. And we, she told us, never have busy slides. Do not read your slides. Look at the audience and be loud and clear. There were PGs in our batch who were very soft, who had very soft voices. She even made them go outside the class, stand outside the door and present the case so that we could all hear them loud and clear. So to me, Dr. Padmarao is a teacher par excellence and who knew how to get the best out of her students. I'm sure most of you out there who were her students do feel that a bit of her has been rubbed off on you. I think so, and I'm very happy. This is madam to me. She was madam to me then, and she's madam to me even today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sujata, for that uh, nice experiences and your experiences at Manipal also with Madam. Dr. Sonia is granddaughter of Dr. A. Padmarav, daughter of Dr. Girija. Both of them are consultants in OBGYN and both of them alumni of KMC Manipal. So now I request Dr. Sonia to share her memories of Madam, the grandmother. Thank you, sir. Respected teachers and my dear friends. Today, I have the honor of speaking about my grandmother, who was also my teacher. A doctor and teacher par excellence, no doubt, but a wonderful mother, wife, and grandmother. I hope today I can bring her to life, so to speak, for those who didn't know her and share with you what made her so special. I lived with my grandparents when I was little. I would tag along everywhere with her, almost like a second handbag. I used to go with her into the hospital and wait in the labor room while she did her work. I have accompanied her many times in the evenings to her office in the old OBG OPD, where she would do her paperwork while I drew on the board in the room, enjoying her company and feeling very proud to be there. <laughs> She managed to combine her work and family life with ease. I remember visiting her Ambalpadi temple every Friday with her, where she would pray for all the difficult cases she had all week. I now realize how dedicated and caring she was. She and my grandfather were always reading, either textbooks or they were preparing for lectures, she spent days on end preparing slides for a talk or oration, and her talks were brilliant, as her old students will vouch for. I will never forget how she compared a graphene follicle to a coconut cut to describe its layers. She taught me the importance of reading and preparation. She was a brave and gutsy lady, not one to color within the lines. In a time when arranged marriages were the norm, she fell in love and married an Andrite, my grandfather. They moved to Manipal along with their one-year-old daughter when Manipal was almost barren. She embraced challenges. She was adaptable. She already knew Malayalam, Tamil, and Telugu, but learned Konkani, Tulu, and Kannada after coming here so well that she could give a talk in them but she had to admit defeat with Hindi. She could never quite master it, but that never stopped her from trying to converse in it. When she was 70 and I was 20, we had gone for a conference in Allahabad with a stopover in Delhi. I was supposed to be chaperoning her, 
but it was actually more the other way around. She wanted to go to some obscure shop in Old Delhi and buy some instruments. All we had was the shop's name and a vague address. So with our smattering of Hindi, mine was as ba bad or even worse than hers, we managed to get into an auto, even find the place, buy the instruments and come back safely. I was quite terrified to be in old crowded Delhi area, but she showed no fear. I was in total awe of her. She always took pride in her appearance, a bright sari, bindi, lipstick, her hair in a bun, jasmine flowers, and of course, plenty of perfume. You could always smell granny before you could see her. Even after her stroke, she made sure she was dressed well. Her motto was, no matter how you feel at the start of the day, get up, dress up, and show up, and things will get better after that. I can't sign off without talking of her eloquence. She made stories so interesting, and she had hundreds of them. Case discussions with her were lively and scary, as she was quite pedantic about how we presented them. She was the one who taught me how to tie surgical knots, the physiology of ovulation, and the one who worried most about whether I had studied enough for an exam. I think of her every day when I see her, my patients, and I miss her. I could go on for hours, but I hope I have given you a glimpse of what she was like. To sum up, she was larger than life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sonia, for sharing those intimate uh, memories of Madam. I request your mother now, that is Dr. Girija, to talk a few words about Madam. Murali has given me 30 seconds. 29. Okay. It's been a learning experience planning the Zoom meeting with meticulous Murali. I really can't thank the Manipal University for letting us be involved in this uh, program which has, has enriched our knowledge. It's only as I grow older now that I find that I really understand the greatness of my mother. And I really am thankful to God for giving me that sense. Having my friend Lucy, who has grown to someone whose opinion is the ultimate in uh, genital cancers, and Gita's friend Urmila, another authority in our subject, is a pride of this evening. Both are very grounded, grounded enough to enjoy a good gossip after, and a good glass of wine. Thank you all, my dear friends and all the alumni for really jo joining this program. Thank you, Murali. Now I request another daughter, Dr. Jai Gauri, to talk a few words. Dr. Jai Gauri. Unmute yourself. Respected teachers and all the wonderful people gathered here today, I thank you all very, very mu much for coming here this um, this evening. I thank the Department of um, Obstetrics and Gynae and especially Dr. Murali for the wonderful way this program has been arranged every year, year after year. And I thank the Mahe also for letting us be a part of this function. Uh, I sincerely thank uh, Dr. Urmila for, take, for giving the oration today. And I also thank uh, Dr. Lucy Gilbert, whom I know much better than Dr. Urmila. Um, a few years ago, I had a situation where I was really desperately in need of reassurance. And, uh, it, and the reassurance came in the form of Dr. Lucy Gilbert with her vast knowledge and her vast clinical acumen. And uh, she said, don't worry, Gauri, everything will be all right. And that for that, I'm always extremely grateful to Dr. Lucy and will always be. I thank all the people who have come here today in large numbers and uh, making this Zoom meeting so very wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jai Gauri. Now the third and the last daughter, Dr. Shubhagita. So Shubhagita, is also a consultant at uh, Sonia Clinic. She was also, she's also alumni of KMC Manipal and contemporary of our today's orator, Dr. Urmila. 
So I think she's the best person to introduce Dr. Urmila. Over to you, Dr. Okay. Am I heard? heard? Yes. Uh, respected Vice Chancellor, Lieutenant General Dr. M.D. Venkatesh, Pro Vice Chancellor Professor PLNG Rao, Speaker of today, Dr. Lucy Gilbert, Dr. Urmila Kovilam, Dr. Muralidhar Pai, HOD of Department of OBGYN, and all friends, family, and colleagues from all over the world. I am Dr. Shubhagita, closely associated with Dr. Padma Rao, being her old student and her third and youngest daughter. On behalf of Dr. Padma Rao's family, I thank Dr. Murali, Dr. Pratap, and their wonderful team for organizing this wonderful meeting. A thank you to also COVID-19 for making this amazing novel meeting possible today and for giving us this opportunity of having Dr. Lucy and Dr. Urimila to deliver the lecture today, both being students of Dr. Padma Rao. Dr. Urmila is an old student of KMC, having done both her undergraduation and post-graduation here in Manipal. She passed out in the year 1985. She completed a fellowship in maternal and fetal medicine from the University of Cincinnati Medical School. While she was faculty in this university, she directed the Diabetes in Pregnancy program. With the intention of decreasing the rising maternal morbidity and mortality, she initiated the Safe Motherhood for All program. Her fields of interest are medical complications in pregnancy, diabetes in pregnancy, fetal therapy and prenatal genetics, maternal morbidity and mortality and critical care. She has several research papers, publications, guest lectures and awards to her credit. Too many to speak about. Murli would thrash me if I went along. So I would just describe all in one word and said, wow, we are very proud to see all your accomplishments. She has taken teaching to a different level by teaching those students who are not good in class. She would ask them to come separately and teach them separately and take them home and teach them while her husband cooked for them. The screen has gone off. She has many awards to her credit, dedicated service and leadership award, community service award for education and community, resident teaching award and hospital hero award. She is married to Mr. Uni Vishwanath, who is an engineer, but now retired. She has two children, a daughter and a son. I present to you Dr. Urmila Kovilam. The citation in her Hospital Hero Award reads as follows. Urmila is the go-to person that sees projects through completion and the glue that holds the team together. She combines science, theory, and personal concern in treating her patients. Patients are comforted knowing that they have a 24-hour access doctor. On behalf of Dr. Dr. Padma Rao's family, Urmila, I thank you for being here with us today. As you join your new venture in the new job of maternal and fetal medicine unit in the Carl Yelinyos College of Medicine, we, your alma maters and friends, wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shubhagita for introducing our orator of the day. Before I read out the citation of Dr. Urmila, I would like to say that she was my teacher as well. And I vividly remember that she was an excellent teacher, both in clinics as well as in OT. And more importantly, she was a kind human being. I would like to now read the citation that's going to be presented to her by the chief guest, our new vice chancellor, Lieutenant General, Dr. M.D. Venkatesh. Dr. Urmila P. Kovilan, we, the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Kasturpa Medical College, Manipal, India, gratefully acknowledge and appreciate your presence and involvement by rendering 
the oration on the ninth professor dr a padma rao memorial postgraduate update held on the 18th july 2020 at manipal india as a director of division of maternal and fetal medicine in crichton university school of medicine ohama nebraska you have added to our knowledge of the fascinating and rapidly growing subject of fetal medicine as director of diabetes in pregnancy program you have greatly enhanced the understanding and management of diabetes in pregnancy with your penchant for learning continuously along with your bubbly sense of humor you remain a model for our youngsters to follow and jump amongst our alumni we congratulate you and thank you for your participation and wish you greater achievements in your endeavor to understand and improve fetal health so this certificate is awarded to dr urmila kovilam now before requesting our chief guest to felicitate dr urmila i would like to introduce him the seventh vice chancellor of mahe from july 1st earlier to that he has served as vice chancellor of sikkim manipal university and before that he was the dean of afmc pune he is a ent surgeon he was the head of the department of ent at afmc pune an excellent and outstanding ent surgeon with training in cochlear implantation and neurotology he has contributed significantly to the field of medical education he has been instrumental in instituting the online admission process at armed forces training institutions at pune sir may i request you to kindly honor our orator today and deliver felicitating address so this is the this is the uh block sir is going to hand over to dr urmila i request dr urmila to kindly accept this block uh, and the citation on behalf of all of us present here today focus on vc yeah uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen professor plng rao dr urmila kovalam the orator for the evening dr lucy gilbert the guest speaker of the evening dr murlidhar pai head of the department of obstetric gynecology and dr krishna rao and all the family members of dr padma rao it's been a very very pleasant evening and it's a memorable evening for me as this happens to be the first function that i am attending and being part of this oration will ever remain in pleasant memories for forever in my uh, in my life so as a vice chancellor i took over on 1st of july though virtually in the same form as it is and i landed up in manipal on the 11th of uh, this month since then i have been in home quarantine uh, as the covid has forbid us from uh, you know getting socially close to each other notwithstanding i compliment dr murli darpai and his department for conceptualizing and so meticulously organizing this oration and i also see that there's a large number of participants who are eager to hear dr urun lakovalam uh, as the guest orator of the evening at the outset let me thank dr murli darpai and the department of obstetrics and gynecology for inviting me to be part of this very unique program and before i do anything else i offer my warm greetings and warm regards to dr tv uh, dr krishna rao and all the members of dr padma rao's family and uh, i thank them for having conceptualized and having been instrumental in instituting this oration in the name of their uh, in the name of dr padma rao who after having heard all the speakers and having 
read about her, this truly is a very, very apt recognition for a wonderful work that he has done as at Mahe, sorry, at KMC, at Manipal, and for the entire community of obstetrics and gynecology in the country. I think she truly deserves this origin to be instituted in her memory. And I'm sure over the years to come, we will have world-class orators or people who have achieved a lot in the field of obstetrics and gynecology, like our Dr. Urmila Kovilam, will be delivering this oration in, in future. This year's awardee of the oration, Dr. Urmila Kovilam, is a well-known authority in the field of maternal fetal medicine, which is a niche subspeciality in obstetrics and gynecology. Presently, she is a senior consultant in Carl Illinois College of Medicine, USA. She is an academician and researcher par excellence. And she has delivered yeoman service to whichever institute she has worked in and in whichever community she has been part of. And she has been much recognized, much published, much awarded. I would not go into any details about this, but uh, Madam, it's truly really an honor to be present on the same uh, platform as with you today. And um, we are all eager to be eagerly waiting to listen to your oration, which will be on diabetes in pregnancy, the challenges. Diabetes in pregnancy, as you're all aware, is perhaps one of the most uh, topic of great relevance in the practice of obstetrics and gynecology. Going forward, I wish Dr. Urmila Kovalam all the very best in all of future endeavors. At the end, I would like to thank Dr. Murlidhar Pai and his entire team for inviting me to this function and also for organizing an online function so flawlessly with so many participants, with pictures so clear and audio even clearer. Compliments to the entire Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And I wish Dr. Murli Pai and his team and the entire Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology all the very best in their continued pursuit of academic and research excellence and in delivering the highest quality of healthcare. Thank you very much, Jai Hind. So thank you very much for those very <clears throat> inspiring words. And thank you very much for accepting our invitation amid this busy schedules. I know you have been on teleconferences whenever I wanted to have a trial run with you, but you have made time for us. And that is a big honor for the whole department. And we thank request- Thank you very much. Sir. Yeah, we promise to keep up the tradition that was set by Dr. Padma Rao and successive heads of the department. And we will do our best to take this university to a higher scale. Now I request Dr. Urmila Kovilam, my teacher, to give the response. Thank you, Jai Hind. Unmute yourself and talk. Just yeah. Yeah, she can talk. Yeah, talk. Thank you for this great opportunity to participate. No, don't share, don't share this. Just talk live. Yeah, correct. Yeah, now talk. Thank you for this great opportunity to be a part of the celebration of our great mentor and guru, Dr. Padma Rao. All of you have already heard the wonderful things that she has done and the life that she has led. The legions of postgraduates that she has trained takes a message far and wide. All that I can say is I'm very proud and humbled to be a small link in this great chain that she envelops this world. She transforms each one of us at the nuclear level. She gives us a small part of herself by being with her, by observing her day to day. I have been very lucky not only to be a student, a postgraduate and work with her in 24 hour presence. Everything that they told about in my hospital hero award comes from her inspiration. 
I would always think, what would Dr. Padma Rao have done? And every patient calls me, I come to be there at their side. So much so, I have sometimes been told to be stealing their patients. But I'm like, okay, if they want me, I am there. I don't mind about the billing codes. I went to the CEO and said, please don't give me any relative value index. Just give me a salary so that I can be a part of every patient. And she inspires me to go on and also the passion for teaching. Every ward rounds, she turned into a teaching effort. And her compassion for the patients, she expected us to be the side of the patient. I remember one day we would round on the patients and sit, gather by the desk and talk with our friends. And we would pretend that we are talking about abruptly or a case when she comes by because she didn't like for us to gossip in labor and delivery. The next day when we came to round, we couldn't see any chairs in labor and delivery. She had all of them removed so that we had no choice but to be by the side of the patient. I thought that was a very neat trick. And uh, I do not know that I'm an orator by any imagination. When Gita asked me this, um, or allowed me to be a part of this great adventure, I felt very excited and nostalgic. And I said, okay, sure, I would like to be here. Little did I realize that this is going to be a, such an event and a, such a, um, what can I say, August meeting. I wanted to be just come there and be in Manipal, hang around with my friends and walk around the wards. That's all what I thought it was. So I hope you will not change my change your opinion about all the good things that the others have said and I will disprove that I'm an orator or a teacher. But I'll share my thoughts in whatever way I can. And if the Zoom meeting fails, I will be forced to be an orator if I cannot move my slides. Um, and again, thank you for all the tireless work, the contributions and the memory and sharing um, Dr. Padmara's achievement. And I have to uh, thank Dr. Sujada Bulsu too. She has done a great job of um, elucidating what Madam had done. And I was a part of the team who did the abdominal circlage. She kept that patient in the ward for months together. And it was such a lovely experience to share that. So much so that I have gone on to uh, do some abnormal circlage, which is not very um, popular here, and also uh, transvaginal circlages uh, to prevent um, preterm delivery and prematurity. Um, again, uh, thank you for this opportunity, and I thank Dr. the Dean, um, the current Vice Chancellor, Dr. Gangadhar Rao, Dr. Pratab, uh, and Dr. Murli uh, for organizing. Um, this function. They were relentless in asking me to keep the timeline. I even tried to weasel out of this saying, hey, it's COVID, I cannot come. Gita said, oh no, we are going to do Zoom meeting. Uh, and I so much so think that we need a little Gita in every house. <laughs> She's the organizer and uh, takes everybody to task and does a wonderful job contributing to the community. The three sisters, um, Girija, um, uh, Gauri and Gita, um, you're wonderful people. And uh, Madam was also like a mentor to me and sometimes like a mother. I remember when I was very hesitant to get married and I would stay and find excuses. And one day I went to her house and I said, I, my uncle has come to get me to go home and I don't want to go. And then she said, Gita, take her to the railway station, put her on that train, let her go home. <laughs> and again, I can never, say enough about the indelible mark that she has left in my heart and my being. Thank you again. I really appreciate this opportunity. And uh, she said that if you people speak ill of you, change the opinion by your actions. Um, I hope I'll be able to live up to her name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Urmila. As I said, it was so humble of you. This is the plaque that we would like to give you. You said that you would come next year, January, and we are waiting for that. And when you, whenever you come here, we would again request the Vice Chancellor to give you this plaque citation personally to you. Thank you. So 
now we have another speaker and another professor professor pratap kumar who was also madam student and he was the former hod of department of obg kmc manipal and currently he is heading the manipal assisted reproduction center and he is a classmate of dr lucy gilbert so i thought he is the right person to introduce dr lucy gilbert to this audience sir over to you uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to introduce my classmate and friend professor lucy gilbert professor lucy gilbert md msc frcog works in canada uh, she is a professor in department of obstetrics and gynecology director of gynecological oncology director of women's health research unit in mcgill university and the university hospital uh she is basically a designated level 4 unit that provides gynecological cancer care for the province of quebec in canada the women's health research unit is active in collaborative multinational clinical trials investigating new precision therapies for gynecological cancers the main area of interest of lucy is basically of early detection of ovarian and uterine cancers while they are still curable she has set up a network of satellite clinics called dovi diagnosing ovarian and endometrial cancers early provides open access and fast track investigations to women over 45 years with symptoms associated with cancers she and the team have developed a new genetic pap test pap test called as dovi gene for detecting these cancers very early before they even cause symptoms the team has completed the phase 1 and 2 testing of the dovi gene test and is set to launch the phase 3 trial she was lucy lazarus as my classmate i somehow found this picture long back taken we were classmates from 1970 to 1976 and lucy lazarus is now of course lucy gilbert i present to you professor lucy gilbert from canada thank you very much sir now i now i would like to read out the citation that's going to be presented to professor lucy gilbert by our guest of honor dr plng rao the citation on the 9th the dr a padmarao post graduate update held on the 18th july 2020 with the department of obstetrics and gynecology kasturba medical college manipal india gratefully acknowledge and appreciate your participation by rendering the guest lecture on your path breaking work in the field of endometrial and ovarian cancer as head of women's health research center mcgill university montreal canada your desire to venture into new frontiers led to the detection of ovarian and endometrial cancers early do we a ground breaking study you are a role model for our young doctors to emulate as director of gynecological oncology at mcgill university montreal canada you were one of the pioneers in robotic gynecological surgery and set a benchmark for all budding doctors to follow armed with unnerving will power and steely resolve softened with humility and kindness you remain a rare bloom amongst the alumni of this institution with sincere admiration and thanks we wish you good health and happiness to pursue your resolve to improve the life of women all over the world and this certificate of appreciation is given to professor lucy gilbert for delivering the invited lecture now before i request our guest of honor professor plng rao to do the honors i would like to introduce him professor plng rao is the pro vice chancellor of health sciences mahe before this he has served as vice chancellor of manipal international university malaysia he has been dean of malacca manipal medical college malacca campus malaysia He was the first registrar of Mahe, 
Associate Dean of Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, Head of the Department of Pediatric Surgery, is a veteran in the fields of medical education, research, clinical services, and administration with almost four decades of distinguished experience. His hobbies and interests include medical photography and the preparation of the medical slides. Now, I request Professor PLNG Rao to do the honors. Good evening to everybody and good morning to our overseas guests. It gives me a great pleasure in presenting a certificate and a memento to Professor Lucy Gilbert, who has achieved a lot in her career and has agreed to be a part of this oration. Professor Lucy Gilbert kindly accept the memento and the certificate on behalf of all of us present here in India. Thank you. Focus on PLNG Rao, sir. Focus on PLNG Rao, sir. Yes, sir. Please go on. Uh, Chief Guest of the Evening, Dr. Venkatesh. Our Dean, Dr. A. Krishna Rao, and the family members. The speakers of the evening for oration, Dr. Urmila, the guest lecture, Dr. Lucy Gilbert, head of the department of OBG, Dr. Murli Dar, members present online for this function. It's a great pleasure for me to be associated with this function this evening. We heard a lot about Dr. Padma Rao, her achievements. At this juncture, I would like to recollect my first interaction with her, the day I joined Manipal way back in August 1979. Since Dr. Krishna Rao, the dean at that time, and Dr. Timapaya, the medical superintendent at that time were on leave, I had to go and meet Dr. Padma Rao who was acting as the acting dean and acting medical superintendent. My interaction was a memorable one, which I cannot forget even today. That was the type of comfort she gave me on the day one when I came to Manipal. Well, I will not go into her achievements, which were spoken by all others. But one thing, the maternity and rural centers created, looked after by her, probably led to Manipal having the lowest maternity mortality in the country comparable to any place even in the world. She has been a great teacher, committed clinician, always approachable. Today, we are having this oration and the guest lecture in memory, in to remember her. This is a great thing, which I would like to compliment the family members and the Mahe administration for organizing this. And to Dr. Morali Darpai, the head of the OBG, and his team to make arrangements so meticulous for this oration. Dr. Lucy Gilbert, who did her MBBS from KMC Manipal, Mangalore, who moved to UK, then to USA, and finally settled in Canada, in Montreal. She did a lot of work on cancer of the ovary and endometrium. When I was going through, I found one quotation from her, which says, what is that? Why is that? There are no changes that have taken place in the last 30 years when so much advance has taken place with respect to technology, cell phones, various other communications. Probably that is the one which stimulated her to look at what can be done, what can be achieved 
what can be contributed towards research of the ovary and endometrium. As I understand, she has achieved a lot. She, as Dr. Pratap explained, her achievements in the field of ovarian cancer and endometrium. She is going to share her experiences in these areas to us. It's a great pleasure to have her with us and I'm waiting to listen to her. As pediatric surgeon, I have been associated with ovarian cancers of the children. I do hope her research into the ovarian cancer extends into the pediatric ovarian malignancies and she would be able to come out not only the etiology, but the preventive measures, which will help humanity a lot. Dr. Lucy, all the best. Thank you very much, Murali and the team, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, sir, for telling us about your early memories with both madam and sir, and giving us that hope to develop our center along with Professor Lucy Gilbert's Center of Excellence. So I now request Professor Lucy Gilbert to give her response. Madam, please. This is indeed a very great privilege to be here. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. P. L. N. G. Rao, Dr. Um, the Vice Chancellor, Pro Chancellor Murli. It's such um, pratap. I, this is um, all my Christmases come together. This is a true, true privilege to be here. Uh, memories are back. Um, and I am honored for several reasons. Because, first of all, this is my alma mater. And secondly, as many people have said, Dr. Padma Rao, I believe, was the single most biggest influence of my life. For a long time, I've tried to emulate her, and I'm so pleased to be here in a function that uh, uh, commemorates her. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, ma'am. We are looking forward to your talk. I think with that, we have come to the end of the formal function. And now I request our own professor, Dr. Akhila, to give the vote of thanks. That's the plaque we have given to Professor Lucy Gilchuk. And now I would request Professor Akhila to give the vote of thanks. Akhila. Good evening. Um, uh, I, uh, Dr. Akhila, from the Department of OBG KMC Manipal, consider this a privilege to propose vote of thanks today. First and foremost, we thank our Chancellor, Dr. Ramdas M. Pai for being constantly supportive of our academic activities. We thank Dr. H. S. Ballard, our pro-chancellor, who has always supported us. We are thankful to him for being a part of this program with the encouraging video message. Our heartfelt thanks to Lieutenant General Dr. M. D. Venktesh, Vice Chancellor Mahe, for sparing his valuable time to grace the occasion and awarding the oration plaque the citation and certificate to Dr. Urmila. Sir, your words of wisdom are very precious to us. Sincere thanks to our Pro Vice Chancellor Health Sciences, Dr. P. L. N. G. Rao, for being with us today and awarding Dr. Lucy Gilbert and delivering the inspiring address. We would like to express our gratitude to Dr. A. Krishna Rao and all members of Dr. A. Padma Rao's family for supporting this academic event every year. We are grateful to you all, sir, for being a part of this wonderful occasion. We would like to thank Dr. Sharath K. Rao, Dean, Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, for being constantly supportive of our academic activities and welcoming the guests and delegates. We sincerely thank Mr. Muttana, Chief Operating Officer, and Dr. Avinash Shetty, Medical Superintendent, Kasturba Hospital, Manipal, for their support in organizing the oration program. Our heartfelt thanks to Dr. Sujata Bhatt and Dr. Sonia for sharing their valuable memories and experiences with Dr. A. Padma Rao. We would like to express our sincere thanks to Dr. Urmila 
for accepting our invitation to deliver the oration today. We also thank Dr. Lucy Gilbert for accepting our invitation and gracing the occasion. World is going through an unforeseen difficulty during which eminent speakers like you sharing your knowledge and experience is truly valuable for the youngsters. Thank you very much. We thank Registrar and all officials and personnel of uh, several departments of MAHE as well as Ad Syndicate for their unstinting support. We can't thank Mr. Amit Arvind Nayak enough who set up this online platform for us and gave countless trials. Sincere thanks to all who attended this web event uh, from across the country, across the globe, including our own postgraduates and faculty of Department of OBG, AMC Manipal and Mangalore. Thank you one and all. Please stay logged in for oration and guest lecture. Thank you very much, Akhila, for that. And I would like to personally thank Dr. Girija, Dr. Jayagaudri, and Dr. Shubhagita, and Sir, for your words and for your cooperation. I would like to personally thank Dr. Shubhagita and Dr. Girija, who have actually been very instrumental in uh, arranging the, both the speakers of the day. And I'm very happy that we have finished in time. We started exactly at 6.30 and we finished exactly at 7.30, 7.33. So that is again with the cooperation of all of you. So I would like to thank all of you once again. And it's time for us to listen to the two very, very important and interesting talks. The first will be the oration that will be given by Dr. Urmila Kovilam. So Madam, may I request you to now share your PPT and start giving the oration. Thank you for the opportunity again once more to partake in the commemoration of our beloved teacher, Dr. Padma Rao. And I will not be a match to any of her capabilities Hope I will be able to share my experience. This is more like sharing my experience and what I have gone through um, during taking care of the NIH Center for Diabetes in Pregnancy for University of Cincinnati, which I was a part for the last um, 14 to 15 years. I happened to be there because there was a change in faculty and most of the leaders had left and immediately after to finish my fellowship. This fell into my lap. I had no other option but to take care of it. So let me say it was by chance and serendipity that I happened to be a part of this um, vastly funded, well-organized, smooth machine, uh, which was uh, diabetes in pregnancy or called the PPG program, pre-pregnancy diabetes and gestational diabetes. My whole Tuesday was dedicated to taking care of these patients. We had to follow them, we had to deliver them, and we had to keep them in our clinic until their reproductive career was um, over. And that's the kind of total care that we provided. So we are constantly at questions and meetings and say, the traditional screening, does it work? Whom should be screened? When should be screened? Why should we screen? Should we screen everybody or is just a high risk group that we should be screening? This is coming to gestational diabetes. Initially, I will address the controversy in gestational diabetes and then go on to talk about the complications in um, diabetes preceding pregnancy. Um, so when you screen just the high risk group and you can go by history, obstetric history of a macrosomic baby or malformed fetus, history of unexplained stillbirth, uh, medical complications of um, hypertension, obesity, and signs of negligence or any other um, positive medical signs, and certain ethnic groups. So all of this high-risk group will account to 90% of our population. We're leaving only 10% out, which is age less than 25 years, BMI less than 25, no family members with diabetes, 
ethnic group with low prevalence and no history of abnormal glucose metabolism and no history of poor outcome. If you ask my opinion, honestly, this will be only one to two percent and you can sum it up as a Caucasian lady, less than 25 years, an early Paris woman. So it's best to do universal screening and that's what we embrace universal screening. Now, when we say universal screening, what should we have the threshold when you do the one hour GCT? Is it 130 versus 140? Again, it depends upon what you want to say. How many percentages? Three hour GTT, 23%. Or do you want to do a three hour GTT with 14%? If you want to increase your sensitivity, you go for 130 as the threshold. Or if you want to increase your specificity, then you go to 140 as the threshold. The controversies always arise in this field of screening. They say there is no significant association with mild intolerance and the perinatal outcome. That is O'Sullivan. And the U.S. Preventive Task Force is always trying to cut corners and reduce the expense. So they said there is no significant reduction in morbidity with screening everybody and treating everybody. So there's no uh, need for this intervention. And Canadian Task Force also echoed a similar opinion. So finally, they decided to do this cardinal study called the hyperglycemia and adverse pregnancy outcome. They gathered 28,000 patients over nine countries in 15 centers and clarified the risks of glucose intolerance, but who were not yet uh, overtly diabetic. This really gave us a huge amount of data and information that are used as the guidelines for current uh, practice. So again, multi-center international study, maternal glycemia and perinatal outcomes were studied and the providers were blinded unless we got a fasting blood sugar more than 105 and they had to be treated. And they did a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test, fasting one hour, two hour, um, values were compared. And the primary outcome was how many patients who were treated had birth weight less than 90 and how could we reduce the primary cesarean section, neonatal hypoglycemia and cord C peptide level more than 90th percentile. If there is hyperinsulinemia, that means there is increased maternal blood sugar, increased fetal uh, hypoglycemia, increased fetal insulinemia, and hence we measure that as cord blood C peptide. And I was glad to be a participant in this study. And the secondary outcomes were, did we decrease preeclampsia? Were we able to reduce preterm delivery, shoulder dystocia, intensive care for the baby, was the reduction in malformation of fetal death. These were the countries that participated, US, Canada, India, Japan, Australia, and the European Perinatal Medicine Association, American Diabetes Association, and Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. 50 delegates deliberated over several months and put forth the recommendation for the two hour 75 gram glucose tolerance test. Because the results showed a linear increase in each primary outcome and they closely mirrored maternal hyperglycemia. And we were able to reduce ICU care and hyperbilirubinemia in the babies and they're clearly related to the maternal blood glucose. Even mild hyperglycemia increased perinatal morbidity and this formed the basis for the International Association of Diabetes and Pregnancy Study Group recommendation. It is unfortunate that not all the countries have embraced it, even though we were the forerunners on the study and participation and contribution and funded this study. You still see, even though this recommendation came out in New England Journal of Medicine in 2011, nine years from now, from then, we still are debating and not embracing this value when the rest of the world has moved on and has embraced this test. Um, except in my center where I insisted that we have to do this. So only random centers in US are doing um, the one-step test, whereas we're still continuing to do the screening followed by the three-hour test. The, okay. These are the other 
authors which also agree with having stringent control or the Glanger in 2005 did similar studies and Crowther in Australia and New Zealand has also done similar studies. The current protocol for screening. The reason I'm talking about the screening so closely is because here everybody is concerned about whom to screen, when to screen and what is the protocol. So at the first visit, anybody comes to you, the first visit you do a fasting blood sugar or a random blood sugar or hemoglobin A1C because you don't get all this patient in the fasting state. And if they're less than 92 milligrams, you can leave them alone. And if this happened to be before 24 weeks, like 12 weeks or 15 weeks, you bring them back and do another test between 24 to 28 weeks. But if you happen to find anybody with 126, 200 or hemoglobin of this, you diagnose them as over diabetes. And less than 92, or equal to 92, you treat them as gestational diabetes. So this is the protocol that we observe. What is this negative impact? Why are we so worried about screening these patients? Why is ACOG not just relenting and just embracing this? They say the burden of disease, when you screen everybody and use a single step test has gone from seven to 17%, there's a psychological and emotional stress given to the patient by saying, hey, you have an abnormal test and their pregnancy is under stress. And of course, resources. You need to have diabetes educators teaching and we end up doing more antenatal testing and there's always the fear, are we going to do unnecessary intervention? Even though America is like all advanced about technology and everything, let me tell you, the rate of cesarean section is very much lower here. And a hope of getting a vaginal delivery still looms in everybody's heart to prevent that first primary section. Okay, this is just going over the criteria again. And the emerging biomarkers, there are other emerging biomarkers now. This was published by Dong Ma et al. in 2019. You can look at the mean glycated CD59 levels and vitamin D levels. They studied about 693 patients undergoing oral glucose tolerance test at 28 to 29 weeks and found a significant difference in patients with positive GTT, elevated mean glycated CD cells, CD59 cells particularly, and elevated vitamin D levels. That's another thing that we are finding is the vitamin D levels are lower in patients with diabetes, and those levels can contribute to the increase in neural tube defects. Again, okay. this slide is dedicated to Dr. Krishna Rao, of Dean, a teacher of physiology, who relentlessly instilled in us the love for physiology and the knowledge to do. And the knowledge, the basic foundational knowledge that is necessary to understand pathology. So in pregnancy, you have cardiovascular system changes, hematological, renal, and metabolic change. The reason I'm emphasizing this in diabetes, it's very important to find out the basic renal function. Serum creatinine, we should know the baseline serum creatinine, 24 hour urine protein, if not possible, you can do a spot serum creatinine, uh, urine creatinine protein ratio, and the metabolic changes of pregnancy you can see that the placental hormones of estrogen, progesterone, growth hormones, placental lactogen, and cortical promoting gluconeogenesis, while there's a single lone range of insulin trying to maintain euglycemia. Cardiovascular system, there's increased plasma volume at 50% and RBC increase with 40%, creating hemodilution, so immediately the patient is a pre-pregnant diabetic if a hemoglobin A1 was seven and when we repeat a hemoglobin A1C it becomes five. It's not because it is an excellent control. It could be just a factor of hemodilution. So we should understand that. Again, this is the hormonal milieu of non-pregnant women. Look at the significant rise in estrogen, progesterone, insulin, cortisol, 
prolactin, somatomyotrophin. So now you can understand why we need to treat them aggressively to maintain euglycemia. The pathophysiology of gestational diabetes is a pancreatic beta cell dysfunction on a background of chronic insulin resistance. And this is found in 75% of lean women and 95% of obese women. This increased risk of hyperandrogenemia produced by thicker cells, increased ACTH, decreased serum hormone blinding hormone globulin, and increased free testosterone. Increase in pro-inflammatory factors and mitochondrial gene mutation has also been recently reported by Zhang et al. The gene mutation in the mitochondria can be in the form of decreased mitochondrial copy number, genome abnormality, or function of transcription and synthesis. So this is a new area of study, the function of mitochondrial gene in polycystic ovary disease and insulin resistance. When you look at the pancreatic ability to respond to a normal pregnancy, in a normal pregnancy, the beta cell number says it's about four and the carbohydrates glucose is about six. It increases up to 12 to eight and then post-pregnancy it goes back to the same. The glucose level goes back to the same and the beta function goes back to the same. Whereas in gestational diabetes, this increase. The baseline hyperglycemia and in pregnancy, it is increased tremendously and it does not come back to normal postpartum. This is the importance why we need to follow those patients. I know I used to have a hard time bringing these patients back for postpartum visits. They say, well, this is not high risk. They can follow up with their primary care. But the story doesn't end just with delivery. We should keep them, we should watch them until their reproductive career is over and also continue them and watch them for development of diabetes, type two diabetes. What are the perinatal risk factors? This increases for preeclampsia, preterm delivery by 45%, macrosomia, shoulder dystocia, operative births, as I've already discussed, cesarean sections increased by 45%, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, and stroke. Specific to the fetus and the neonate, you have macrosomia, cardiomyopathy, respiratory distress syndrome, birth trauma, metabolic syndrome, and stillbirth. You know, the pediatrician among our group, they'll be well aware of all these patients and we all, all these symptoms, and we always have to have a neonatologist or pediatrician present for delivery for a diabetic mother. Now, coming to pre-existing diabetes. You have type one diabetes forms only five to 10 percentage, even though they formed 90% of our population in the pregnancy, pre-pregnancy diabetes NIH study. This absolute insulin deficiency, autoimmune destruction, and low serum peptide concentration. Another thing, when you see a thin diabetic in your clinic, a thin um, gestational diabetic, it's, it'd be a good idea to check serum C peptide to find out, are they already diabetic? Positive islet cell antibodies also can be detected in them, which are high tendency to become a type two or insulin deficiency diabetic. Type two diabetes are 80% of the population, originally called MODI, not spelled M-O-D-I. Now we have been uh, identified and addressed by specific gene defects and they have specific names. This is not in the scope of this lecture. Our friends who are watching and the internal medicine doctors can tell you more about it but this is an important thing, defective phosphorylation or abnormal glucokinase. These are things that can be changed or corrected by gene therapy, uh, mitochondrial DNA changes. So these are all just for academic interest. Four to 8% of type two diabetes can also present at a young age. And I'm sure this is increasing because of the increasing trend of uh, obesity. Unrecognized type one diabetes, if you see a lean female, need for insulin in gestational diabetes, DKA in gestational diabetes, it's also an important thing. Drugs, patients are on chronic steroid therapy, protease inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, alcohol is not a drug, but chronic use, antipsychotics, people who are depressed and taking medications, 
and diuretics, if they are hypertensive and on di thiazide diuretics, you should screen them for diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a complex disease with insulin resistance and hepatic insulin receptors, increased gluconeogenesis. We have already talked about this. Then you look at the complications. Why are we so worried about this? This cardiovascular risk increased for hypertension is associated in 73% of the population. Maybe in India, it may be not be that much, but here with increased BMI, we see a high risk of hypertension associated with gestational um, diabetes. Um, this is blindness is more for type of pre-gestational diabetes. Renal functions, 43% of the patients have already some underlying renal damage. So at preconception or at the first visit, I advise or recommend to do a 24-hour urine protein to get the baseline. So later on, when they develop preeclampsia, we know whether it is pre-existing renal disease or it is superimposed preeclampsia because that is a very important um, clinical uh, finding when we have to act to deliver the patient. So it's very important to get a baseline 24-hour urine protein. If not possible, you can ask them to give a spot test for um, urine protein um, ratio. Cardiovascular um, CNS, most of them are already affected, increased risk for stroke, amputations to the microvascular, uh, damage caused by uh, hypoglycemia. Oral hygiene is very important. We al always send them to a dental um, consultation. And pregnancy complication, this is our area of interest, which I'll be going through. Okay. This, I wanted to show you the micro, how the microvascular circulation is affected by glycosylated hemoglobin. The ability for glycosylated hemoglobin is decreased to deliver oxygen, carrying capacity and delivery and microvascular complications into causing clinical malfunction. This is the fundamental problem with increased um, hyperglycation of the um, red blood cell. And we, the pre-gestational diabetics, the type 1 and type 2 who present to pregnancy, already diagnosed with diabetes, we always get a retinal examination, dilated retinal examination to find out where they are in their um, neuronal health and ophthalmological health. If they have proliferative retinopathy, we send them for laser therapy and stabilization of this because this can, rapid control of blood sugar can deteriorate uh, the vision and suddenly they will complain and they able and they can also get retinal detachment and if they are preeclampsia you know we'll have retinal exudates I remember when dr padma rao used to encourage us to do ophthalmoscopy in the ward we looked we peered into their eyes and we learned a lot now unfortunately we are not doing that anymore we are sending them all to ophthalmologists carpal tunnel syndrome even though it is not a uh, neurological manifestation not considered as neuropathy is increased in these patients and you should inquire about them. This is the most important thing, renal function in pregnancy. The kidney takes a lot of beating in pregnancy. Increased glomerular filtration rate and increased intraglomerular pressure. So these diabetics, pre-pregnant diabetics are all always already on an ACE inhibitor. In pre-pregnancy, we have to ask them to change to a calcium channel blocker which will maintain lower intraglomerular pressure and prevent or decrease the proteinuria and also cause uh, renal vascular protection. So what we usually use is diltiazem uh, once daily. It will also um, mask sometimes the onset of preeclampsia. So we need to um, carefully monitor them. If you can do a continuous glucometer log and daily stick your finger six times a day, they can definitely take a blood pressure too. So we also send them home with a blood pressure kit. Gastroparesis is not very commonly talked about, but these patients are also have um, stagnation and the more science about this gastroparesis now, we have gastric, smooth gastric emptying is dependent upon the synchronous and coordinated act, action and relaxation of the antrum. This can be very subtle and annoying and it makes the timing of the insulin dose very difficult. That's the reason that we need to find out whether they have gastroparesis. And 
Of course, this is done in consultation with the GI team and a team effort. When all else fails, neurostimulators may also be needed. Now coming to the prenatal care, it's a good idea to start with a preconceptional um, hemoglobin A1C or blood glucose values. This indicates excellent control, it's about four. And if it is fair, it's about six, seven and above, it is poor. Okay, next slide. Going to diabetic embryopathy. We are concerned about diabetic embryopathy. This is uh, maternal hypoglycemia also increases significant reactive oxidative stress, vascular disruptions, and yolk sac failure. Again, I cannot stress the importance of preconceptional care and control, but let's start as soon as we can. So what we did was in Cincinnati, we have a great relationship between the children's hospital. We can walk over to the children's hospital there and that is what made the possibility of establishing uh, the fetal care center because we worked in very close collaboration with the children's hospital. It's a beautiful facility and our, my hobby was to go over to children's hospital for lunch. And it's such a beautiful, and they had all the facilities there. So I also used to go into the pharmacy and tell them, hey, please tell me all the children that, uh, adolescent children who are diabetes so that send them to preconceptional care. So by bringing down um, the embryopathy, a common condition, okay. This is the few um, cases that we had in our clinic the importance of doing a 12-week ultrasound. The 12-week ultrasound, we see this a patient with a cystic hygroma. And if you have to find out, I think my mouse is creating a little, yeah. This is a cystic hygroma in a 12-week fetus. And we can also detect spina bifida as early as 12 weeks. If you see an empty, a, posterior fossa because the spinal cord is already herniating here. So this is a sign that you have to closely watch for in the first trimester of the screen. This is a patient with encephalocele. Then this is a spina bifida in 3D image. We can also do excellent 3D rendering with the spine of the baby. And then look at this beautiful This is a patient with an encephalocele, again with uncontrolled pregestational diabetes. This was my patient who was delivered in September 2003, September 11. And the MRI is the caudal regression syndrome. I still remember Dr. Padmarao telling us if the patient has the caudal regression syndrome, it is definite that he has pregestational diabetes. This is one of the hallmarks. We can be almost be sure that this is what this, she's suffering from. Um, the MRI helps to elucidate the details. And look at this pelvis. It's a rudimentary pelvis. And of course, macrosomia. The, giant babies. This is more for type 2 syndrome, uncontrolled diabetes, and um, gestational diabetes too. Now let us look at the some cardiac abnormalities because it's very important when you screen patients with diabetes. So it's important. I'm going to play a little bit of the clip. We can't go through the whole thing. This is a four chamber view that we are able to find the atrioventricular valves, the right ventricle, the left ventricle and the atrium. And you have to always use different angles to rule out septal defects. This is the normal fetal echo, the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve. This is the location of a three vessel view. 
and if you include the right ventricular outflow, the left ventricular outflow, and the crossing of the vessels, later we have to also find out the three vessel view, the superior vena cava, the iota, and the pulmonary artery. From the pulmonary artery is in front and the iota in middle and the superior vena cava. And the trachea will be somewhere here, if you can remember the acronym in past, pulmonary artery, iota, as superior vena cava and trachea. Coming to some abnormalities. Um, so after having reviewed the normal findings of the echocardiogram, the abnormalities you, you can see here, this is the right ventricle, the left ventricle, and what is happening? The iota is arising just about overriding the septum. When the iota is overriding the septum, you know that it's not normal. And the right ventricular hypertrophy that we usually do not find it in the fetus is a finding later on in um, pediatric life. So when you have these four findings of a large ventricular septum, overriding iota, and a very narrow pulmonary artery, very narrow pulmonary artery, you think of the trilogy of follow. And it's important that we immediately get a prenatal consultation with a pediatric cardiologist who can evaluate the baby. And this baby will need um, prostaglandin infusion to keep communication between the left and the right side of the heart until they're stable for surgery. So it's the importance of a coordinated team effort. Whereas in this picture, what you're seeing, the lower right-hand corner picture, I don't know whether you're able to, I hope you're able to see the screen. Um, this is a single vessel that is arising and it is dividing, bifurcating. When you see a single vessel arising and bifurcating, you think of um, truncus arteriosus. This is very common. Again, this is another case, the truncus arteriosus. They have a single vessel, They're both the single vessel here. This is truncus arteriosus. This is very commonly seen in diabetic pregnancy. This is a case with cardiac hypertrophy. This is real and this is not an imagination. I couldn't believe this. This is a huge ventricular septal hyperplasia. Right now I'm looking into measuring, standardizing the interventricular septal thickness and correlating it with maternal blood sugar. And it's hard to get the volume studies when you have a lot of patients coming in and out, but it's really worth looking at the end organ damage that we are doing with this poorly controlled diabetes. This is again concentric left ventricular hyperplasia in utero. This is again a very common lesion that is found in diabetic pregnancies where you have, what's this? This is parallel sign. The, the iota and the pulmonary uh, parallel, they're supposed to cross at this time. If you do not see the crossing, then you think of transposition. The importance of identifying these conditions prenatally is because you have to be prepared for delivery. These deliveries have to be done in collaboration with pediatric surgeons and they need to be available cardiothoracic surgeon. We get a prenatal team uh, involving pediatric cardiology, cardiothoracic surgeon, genetic counselors, social work supporters, and deliver them in children's hospital if possible. Um, they have a labor and delivery unit there. These babies can be delivered there. They can be delivered vaginally. Cardiac anomaly is not an indication for cesarean section, but you should have a neonatologist for immediate um, resuscitation. So that is the importance of prenatal diagnosis and close follow-up. This is a patient with a, this baby did not make it. Cardiac hypertrophy is significant. This is a post-mortem evaluation. The moment you see pathology slides, you know, I, I don't need to tell you this baby didn't make it. Um, Twin pregnancy is a very common, uh, about 10 to 20 percent incidence of twinning with diabetes. A lot of nutrition when this environment is full of nutrition, this nobody doesn't know, it just hyperovulates. This is a baby. Can you imagine what this is? This is a monoamniotic, monochorionic twin. Both of them are happy together, but we are not too happy because the cord is entangled, absolute entanglement of the cord. We usually admit them around 28 to 30 weeks and do continuous monitoring and also do Doppler studies of each of these vessels. As long as there is um, no absent and diastolic flow or reversal of the end diastolic flow, we try to keep them in utero so that we can achieve uh, 
some amount of maturity up to 32 weeks and give steroid therapy to enhance fetal lung maturity before delivery. Again, the, the reason that I was interested in diabetes in pregnancy was I still remember my first, first posting in OBGYN as a student in the clinics and we went to the clinic, we were a big group standing outside Dr. Palmera was examining patients in the clinic and um, one of the cubicles they were sobbing and crying and she took a lot of time with the patient and, um, and Dr. Um, Lucy Lazarus at that time, I do not know whether she'll recall, she was a senior um, resident, a postgraduate there. She came and took the patient, took care of her and um, took her to labor and delivery. Dr. Padmarao asked us, what is the commonest cause of undiagnosed or unknown fetal demise, unexplained fetal demise? Everybody is like, why should we have a reason if it's unexplained? Then it remains unexplained. She said, no, you have to always find a reason. We call it unexplained, but if you go evaluate her, you are going to find diabetes. Lo and behold, this patient had undiagnosed diabetes. It, I'll be dating myself if I say back in 1981, 82, you know, when we had a diabetic patient, we used to put them in a special room uh, towards uh, closer to the internal medicine ward where the internist could come and also evaluate, uh, write down the diabetic doses, insulin doses, and then go. And of course, madam could always, would always walk up and change the dose and that would suit the patient better than in the consultation from the internal medicine. It always fascinated me how she had a flair for diabetes. She would always, I think she could smell um, diabetes. She could always diagnose and suspect. And, and whenever I think of um, all these sick patients and her passion for tight control, that forms the foundation of better outcome is the uh, good tight control. We always talk about what should be the goals and argue. Um, later when we go through the continuous glucose monitoring data, you will find in diabetic patients, the glucose values are high, but in a normal, non-diabetic pregnant woman, please remember this. If you don't understand anything from my talk, if I've gone fast, I have a habit of talking too fast and I was thrown out of class while I was in college for talking too fast and reading too fast. I said, he can't understand you. Go stand outside and relax and come back. But um, I'm trying to share more as much as I can but the continuous glucose monitoring in non-diabetic pregnant women, the values are as close as 70, as, as close as um, 70 to 60. So your goal should be that. Okay, so accreta spectrum disorder. This is um, increased with the cesarean section with macrosomia. So that's something that you have to prevent. Again, self blood glucose monitoring is the cardinal role for principles of therapy, medical nutrition therapy, oral agents, metformin, a carbo sulfonylurea, originally it was sulfonylurea first, then we moved it to metformin, of course, insulin. Again, this is the fasting glucose levels. We tried to get it less than uh, 85, but there are people who say 95 and 90, one hour, 110, two hour, definitely it will come back, but you can afford some relaxation. But one hour less than 85, definitely postprandial less than 110. Please remember those two values. Um, frequency of monitoring, one hour versus two hour. The closer we get to one hour because Indian meals are usually carbohydrates, so one hour best. If you eat a high protein meal, it is two hours. If you eat a high fat meal, it's two hours. So meal specific variation, bear that in mind. Intermittent versus continuous, these are all um, depending upon the facilities available. Remember, each additional testing, there's a 0.2 reduction in hemoglobin A1C. So when you are in doubt, ask them to test and then they can increase their insulin dose um, or skip their ice cream for the day, whatever. So again, meal specific variation here, breakfast and lunch, what we found in lunch, it was not significant, whether you did one hour or four a two hour. So at least for breakfast and dinner, when there's a high carbohydrate content, let them do that. Breakfast is a big culprit in US for people eating cereal. So they can change from cereal to eggs or maybe um, or whole grains. The glucose sensors, there are variable uh, uh, glucose sensors available now. Um, 
and communicate with the sensors in your tissue fluid to the insulin pump and they communicate and you can deliver, uh, set it to your blood glucose goals. Uh, importance of doing continuous glucose monitoring, you can detect post uh, midnight hypoglycemia. Your early morning hyper could be due to your undiagnosed midnight hypoglycemia. Again, you glycemic diet, I'm not going into the diet. All of you have dietitians and have a good sense, but remember, avoid that is white and yellow, rice, pasta, bread, potato, and more of colors, more of vegetables, whole grains, exercise. You can have under desk exercises in this COVID time. You're always sitting around in front of your screen. Whenever you give medications, going through the medications, you have to think of the effect of the baby, placental transfer. The sulfonylureas were originally used, but you know that it can cause prolonged hypoglycemia in the baby and avoid an hepatic and renal injury. It can increase cholestasis, this 10% primary failure, and you will need uh, additional agents. So now we have moved away from sulfonylurea and embracing more of metformin. It increases insulin action through the peripheral tissues, it inhibit hepatic neoglucogenesis, weight loss and less of hypoglycemic incidence. Lactic acidosis and intestinal tolerance are not a huge issue. Protect the beta cell in the offspring too and decrease cell cycle proliferation. So it has an anti-malignancy effect, but there are two preparations of metformin which has been recalled by the FDA due to increased levels of chemical NMDA because they have, um, that can in fact cause increased risk for cancer. So you should be mindful of that. What is the preparation you're using? Consider an alpha glucosidase inhibitor if this just post meal hypoglycemia. So it decreases the formation of monosaccharides and it can decrease hemoglobin M1C, but can cause some amount of bloating. A carbose, okay. Time course of beta cells is important to remember. Uh, it runs out, it gets exhausted. So intensive insulin therapy, intensive control will spare the beta cells and increase your pancreatic beta cell lifespan. Insulin molecule, this is my most favorite molecule. This is discovered at the Case Western University and developed by Eli Lilly. We are part of a um, team that helped them um, uh, study the role of um, fast acting or rapid acting insulin in uh, pregnancy by changing the molecules. So it's secreted as pro-insulin and it is an alpha chain and a beta chain and connecting peptides. So immediately when converting from pro to active insulin, the C peptide is released. And this is what you measure to find out the level of insulin, whether the patient is type one or type two. This is again, fascinating molecule. Action, I'm not going to go into this detail. You know, it acts at the level of the liver, the muscle and the adipose tissue, extensive teaching in the physiology classes. So how do we utilize this? Um, by changing the amino acids as part of uh, proline, by changing proline and replacing it by aspartate, you get a rapid acting insulin that is um, called insulin aspart. You can see, look at the onset of action here, it will be in the next slide, aspart called Lyspro. This is regular insulin. Aspart insulin is very useful for controlling postprandial hyperglycemia. You have to just give it and start your meal. So within 15 minutes onset of action and the duration is two hours, very good to cover um, prandial hyperglycemia. NTH is the intermediate acting and the detamer is long acting and glargine is again prolonged acting. There's some worry about increasing growth uh, and receptor at the receptor level with glargine. So we are not very uh, bold about using glargine in pregnancy, but you can use single detema or twice NPH or have a pre-mixed combination. And again, remember the site. When you teach the patients, you have to see if the abdominal injections versus upper thigh means upper arm, the duration may be, may be slightly different. This is again demonstrating uh, onset of insulin. Aspart insulin, Lyspro, regular glargine. You should have a sheet of this in front of you before you consult the patients and look at their blood sugars. 
premix combination is um, used widely in rest of the world where the patients cannot um, or do not want to give multiple injections you can use this bid because the regular insulin will cover part of the lunch um, insulin pump affords very good control excellent control closest to nature and you can achieve a 50 percent reduction in the total amount of insulin that is decreased because you start off with the 50 percent if the patient needs 100 units, you can start off with 50 units and there will be a continuous glucose, uh, continuous insulin, whereas the detector is sensing the patient's blood glucose. And again, this is a separate class by itself, um, so I will not go into this. Recombinant insulin, we have talked about this Lyspro by changing the amino acids, lysine and proline. It is a full biological activity. Glargine is by adding aspargine. No hypoglycemia in this long-acting insulin, but it cannot be mixed. So we, I saw, alluded to the insulin pump and for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the details of the insulin pump. Advantages, of course, decrease variability, decrease hypoglycemia and decrease fasting blood sugar, decrease DKA. These are the important things. And when you have a poor control and a dawn phenomenon, you can use that and a flexible lifestyle. If you're a dancer or a tennis player or need insulin more than 100 units, 200 units, insulin pump is a good. Uh, the current trend is towards continuous glucose sensing and computerized database and closed loop pancreas. And especially in this COVID time, we just, we have all these patients enter the data and we sit at home and control their blood sugar. This was a patient, I can tell you, this was how her blood sugar was. Each day, we would have, I mean, finally with intense therapy, we managed to get to this slide. Um, again, uh, role of smartphone is with the continuous update is significant in increasing um, compliance and attaining control and decreasing the need for insulin and better neonatal outcome, but we did not have adequate patients to attain a significant um, data. It's just showing uh, images and I will uh, skip through the few slides for time. Again, this is how a continuous data sensor uh, looks. We review this with like hundreds of data points every single day. Uh, antenatal surveillance and timing of delivery is of utmost importance, but um, not within the scope of today's lecture. Intrapartum management is another area that we have um, some updates, so I thought I'll take you through this. Macrosomia. Okay, role of steroids is very important. Even if they are 37 weeks, they, if they are not mature, you, up to 35 to 36 weeks, we can give steroids to help the baby's um, lung maturity because from 35 to 37 weeks, we still have 15 to 20% of RDS in these babies and they uh, have to be admitted in the NICU. So decrease that we have admitting the mothers and give them steroids under use of glucose stabilizer. Uh, and we are able to um, decrease the, see this is the glucose stabilizer is an instrument where we just um, the sensor is connected to the mother and we set the target goal in the computer we just input how what do you want the blood glucose range you want it at 80 you can set it to 80 or do you want it at 100 you can set it at 100 so intrapartum time we just put in the data our goal is 100 milligrams of um, blood glucose and that sensor is put in the patient. So the sensor keeps an alarm when there is hypoglycemia or when the mean glucose is more than 101. And then we are able to, the, the detector will tell us how much dose to uh, provide to the patient. So the hypoglycemia is reduced. This is a very wonderful uh, software. The glucose stabilizer software it is developed by the University of Indiana. And we had some input. This is how you uh, this is a recent patient here. The glucose when she came in was 209 and the drip rate was 3. And we put in 0.02 and our goal. That's all we put in. And then the sensor will tell us how much insulin to deliver. So after uh, like two hours, two to four hours, we were able to contain excellent control. And these babies do not have neonatal hypoglycemia. One thing that you have to understand is to prevent neonatal hypoglycemia, 
the last week of pregnancy and the few days prior to delivery is important. If you need, you can admit them and control the blood sugar. It's very important. It's instead of, you know, tasking the neonatologist with this baby risk for RDS, we can do a little bit and control their blood sugars. Preconception counseling is essential. Why it's classification? Uh, retinopathy is R, nephropathy is class F, and doing end organ evaluation, thyroid function test, hypothyroidism goes along, check their thyroid and give them the needed, you want to maintain TSH less than 2.5, and then your yeah, diabetes will be well controlled. If they're on um, ACE inhibitors, switch them to calcium channel blockers. Um, tight glycemic, you want the hemoglobin A1C to be five to six. Um, with pre Pregnancy counseling, you can reduce the hemoglobin A1C, folic acid supplementation, and also with myoinositol, it decreases the incidence of neural tube defects in these babies. Start low dose aspirin at 12 weeks, and also contraception until they are conceived. But this will not help. This was an um, image sent by Dr. Kumar in the last couple of um, days, and I thought it was a useful thing. The babies come out with the IC IUD, it will not work. Congenital malformation risk, it's important to explain to them. Cardiac anomalies increase 18 times, CNS 16 times, anencephaly, and all of these abnormalities. So it's important. If it is less than six, you can almost control. The control population has 3% malformation. So your goal, if you get less than six, more than 8.5, 22%, more than 10, 35% fetal anomalies. Instead of building um, fetal care centers, I think we should build preconceptional centers. And I I'm in the process of working towards that. It will be so much cheaper and cost effective. Um, the, what is the significance of GDM? Four to 18% significant rise in type two diabetes and risk of recurring GDM in subsequent pregnancy, 60 to 90%. So, but if they lose a weight, 10% of their body weight in between pregnancy, this risk can be reduced by 50%. So don't think your job is over by just delivering the baby. You need to call them back. You need to keep them under your watch. You need to give them telephone call reminders until they reach their goal. And also the best thing is to have a friend and you know community help. Risk for fetal macrosomy is also uh, important, increased. This is population health significance. We can significantly decrease the incidence of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, because the population attributable risk is significant. And preventive, and by reducing diabetes, you can reduce hypertension, cardiovascular morbidity, you can reduce malignancies. Um, okay, you have to think about COVID. Pregnancy is an immunocompromised condition, it adds another layer, increased susceptibility and severity. We had a patient who came in with a hypoxia of 90, 85, a diabetic patient with the intubator and keep her and steroid her for fetal maturity and deliver her. Vertical transmission can be present in COVID. We already talked about this with the cardiovascular disease. Every seven seconds, someone is estimated to die from diabetes and we can definitely prevent this. And these patients are under the age of 60. Weight loss. The reason I had to tell this was because we had a big um, center for weight loss and teenage patients getting gastric surgery and thing, and they would become pregnant because they start ovulating the moment they become normal weight. And But we don't talk to them about contraception. So it's important to know about this. And when these patients present, you have to check their micronutrient, AD, EK vitamins, uh, since jejunum and ileum are primary sites of absorption, iron, calcium, B12, so just a reminder as a part of preconceptional counseling. Um, so you have to have pre-gestational diabetes, any women with gestational diabetes, insulin intolerance, impaired glucose tolerance, all this is a large group of patients that you have to follow. Because of all these problems, the childhood obesity, I can go on and on, but I know my day has come to uh, this has to talk. Uh, so I have to thank Dr. This was the team. I don't know whether you're able to see this. This was the team of doctors who helped me. Dr. Menachem Yadovnik, he's still with the NIH. He was my mentor and he was also my OB when I had gestational diabetes. Dr. Jane, Jane Corey, 
here, this is the diabetes in pregnancy team and I was very glad to be a part of this. And the 30 years ago, and we are still collecting data on the babies of mothers with diabetes and what is happening to them. Dr. Rosen is in New York, um, still in Cincinnati, in NIH. So these were immense um, people. Remember the Barker's hypothesis? This is what the baby is saying, killing me softly in utero. Let's not do that because you have fetal origin of adult hypothesis and Becker's hypothesis. Chronic degenerative disease of adult health, including chronic hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, may be triggered by circumstances decades earlier in utero. And we as obstetricians hold the unique ability to control that, modulate that, and give these babies a better outcome and transgenerational health. So it will affect their life, uh, affect their test scores, income and health and outcome in subsequent generations. So let us not do this. Let us prevent this at this route. We can even, yeah. And again, uh, wonderful thanks to Dr. Padma Rao. I cannot say how much I'm indebted to her in every being as a student, as a teacher. And more than that, to be at the patient's side all the time. And I would tell my students, I'm going to remove all the chair from labor and delivery. And they were like, where did you get this idea from? I'm like, okay, I know, I got it from my teacher. And um, let the light within her also be shared to us and let us help her. Padma Rao, she's also goddess of education as the vehicle of Saraswati. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Urmila, for that one brilliant, brilliant, oration. So there's so much depth into the talk. Uh, we really wish that we will be able to uh, associate with your research sometime. And we are re really looking forward to your coming to Manipal in January. Now I request Professor Lucy to deliver her guest lecture. You can please share your slides, ma'am. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can Excellent. hear and you can see your slide as well. Okay, so thank you very much. And again, uh, it's, uh, I'd like to congratulate you for um, host making everything go so well. It truly, truly uh, has been, you pulled it off um, very well with all uh, more than 350 participants. Thank so, you, I thank you for uh, once more formally, um, uh, Dr. Muralidhar, uh, my dear friend Pratap, uh, uh, Chancellor, Pro, um, Vice Chancellor, Pro Chancellor, Dean, and um, a lot has been said about Dr. Padma Rao. I, I would just sum it up once more in one sentence that she's somebody I tried to emulate. Uh, she was fierce. Uh, loyal, protective, and one of the greatest teachers. I'd also want to say a little bit about her family. This is an oh, uh, down memory lane, 1974. Um, um, Girija and uh, Geeta came for my sister's wedding. Uh, that's Girija. She looks pretty young there. Geeta, and that's myself. Uh, and again, this is Geeta. And I showed this photograph because Padma Rao was my teacher, uh, Dr. Krishna Rao was our dean, but this whole family did a lot for our family, as they did, I believe, for many, many people in Manipal. Uh, they uh, welcomed us to our house. They were um, really uh, kind, fed and watered us on many occasions. And I remain immensely, immensely grateful to them. Before I launch into the scientific part of the, my talk, I'd like to say uh, a, a small incident about Dr. Krishna Rao. Uh, he was uh, my um, physiology professor, but what I remember him most for, and what I repeat the story is, when we came back from Kerala for, uh, after my sister's wedding, he asked us how everything went. And um, 
we complained that uh, taking the bus in Kerala was awful because we got pinched in our bottoms, etc. And it was awful. And I remember Dr. Krishna Rao telling us, I don't see why you had a problem. I've been on the bus many times and nobody pinched me. So, um, so uh, this is something I remember about him and I do repeat the story, especially with the Me Too movement. Now, I am, uh, I hold uh, 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 two positions. I am a professor in the Department of Obs and Gynae at uh, um, McGill University, and I direct the Gynecological Cancer Service for the hospital, which is McGill University's health center. Uh, this is the university. It's a sprawling university uh, spread over downtown Montreal. This photograph is taken in fall. Uh, you can see the beautiful fall colors. It, the winters are brutal with temperatures going down to minus uh, 30, minus 40. But we do have wonderful summers and we're having a very good summer now. This is, uh, we moved from the old hospital to the new hospital uh, about five years ago. And this is a picture of the new hospital and the working conditions are a bit better. The customary uh, disclosure slides, I have no conflict of interest. I have um, nothing to, important to disclose, except that I am pathologically obsessed with these cancers. And uh, so uh, to summarize, I'd be uh, speaking about the current situation, what we have now to offer women for the early diagnosis of ovarian and endometrial cancer, and what I expect uh, will be available in the next four or five years, which is what I'm working on. So why am I, um, uh, uh, Dr. P. L. N. G. Rao was kind enough to look at one of my codes to say that, uh, uh, to give some insight into why I'm so obsessed with these cancers. Together in North America, it's different in India because cervical cancer is a big problem there. But in, uh, we are fortunate that uh, in uh, Canada, as in many uh, high income countries, cervical cancer is not a problem. It's 15th or 16th in, in terms of mortality. So, but ovarian and endometrial cancer together come within the top four uh, 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 cause of death in women. It's a very big uh, cause of health expenditure uh, uh, mortality. And these costs are rising as uh, the life expectancy rises, the incidence is rising, and the death rates are increasing. And um, we have uh, the, deaths uh, the death rates from ovarian cancer has not budged in more than 30 years. We managed to make people live a little longer with huge uh, uh, expenditure in terms of chemotherapy, PARP inhibitors, uh, increasing uh, targeted uh, therapies, but eventually we lose the patients. So early diagnosis is the key. This is a paper uh, we published this year really, and it, uh, and it alludes to the cost of not diagnosing it early. The only time you can cure these cancers if, is if you diagnose it early and you can remove the cancers in its entirety. If you can't, this is uh, your, uh, the treatment of first recurrence. You can keep it under 50,000. By the time it recurs three times, and that is the pattern. Uh, most of these patients uh, are present to us late, 80% um, present to us uh, by the time the cancer is already metastatic. And you can see that the median cost per patient exceeds $100,000. So this is why early diagnosis and getting it the very first time is the most important. Uh, a brief um, um, a reminder about the types of ovarian cancer. We say uh, ovarian cancer can arise from the epithelium. So the epithelial tumors are serous cancers, mucinous cancers, endometrioid, clear cell transitional. 
you have your germ cell uh, tumors, dysgerminoma, dis yolk sac, embryon embryonal cell, chorea carcinoma, immature teratomas, et cetera, and your sex cord tumors. Uh, Dr. PLNG Rao, uh, uh, the pediatric surgeon, uh, was wondering whether um, we would be able to help with um, childhood cancers. And fortunately, with childhood cancers, because they are predominantly germ cell cancers, we do achieve very good cure rates. We struggle with the epithelial adult ovarian cancers. 75% of uh, all ovarian cancers are high-grade epithelial ovarian cancers, and 90% of all deaths due to ovarian cancer is from high-grade serous ovarian cancer. So uh, this is why I'm obsessed with this. And again, if you diagnose ovarian high-grade serous ovarian cancer, which accounts for 90% of the deaths in stage one, um, you can cure it, achieve 95% cure rates, but less than 10% of cancers are detected at this stage. Most cancers come to us in stage three and four. And in stage three and four, um, the vast majority will die. And die, uh, we may, with all those treatments, first line, second line, third line, manage to prolong life for three to five, six years, but they, they eventually die. So what is available now for a screening for ovarian cancer and help with early detection? Literally next to nothing. A, screen, a screening with blood uh, tumor marker CA125 is not recommended. Transvaginal ultrasound scans are not recommended. There have been uh, several um, uh, very important uh, high um, uh, level one studies. The PLCO studies uh, study uh, published in JAMA and the Jacobs UKC talk study, which the mother of all randomized control trials, which involved 250,000 women, uh, showed that screening uh, with CA125 and um, endovag ultrasound scan had very minor effect on reducing mortality and morbidity. So uh, uh, we, I started the Dubby Clinic, which is detecting ovarian cancer early, wondering whether the reason people did so badly was because the symptoms of ovarian cancer are very, very vague. Um, they're hardly gynecological upper GI and whether giving fast track access to women with endometrial can uh, with uh, symptoms of ovarian cancer, the vague symptoms, bloating, um, dyspepsia, uh, may, uh, pelvic discomfort, perhaps bleeding. We cast the net very wide giving ra rapid access to women with these symptoms would reduce the mortality and morbidity. And we published this in Lancet Oncology in 2012. And what we found to our immense surprise is that by the time women get these symptoms, there was already, even while the ovaries looked beautiful, there was already disease under the diaphragm. So this is the fallopian tube. This is the ovary. The cancer actually does not start in the ovary. High-grade serous cancer. I showed you the diagram, epithelial ovarian cancer. The reality is that only about 25% of uh, high-grade serous cancer arise in the ovary. The vast majority of high-grade serous cancer actually starts in the fallopian tube. And, and because the fallopian tube is exposed to the peritoneal cavity, it drops like uh, snowflakes and very early go along the paracolic gutter into the abdominal cavity. And this is the undersurface of the diaphragm. So while the ovary still looks normal, 
there's already little specks of cancer in the undersurface of the diaphragm. This is why uh, women get bloating and all those symptoms before they get pelvic symptoms. But by the time nobody takes them seriously, and by the time they present to a gynae oncologist, there's already the omentum is full of disease, there's disease scattered all over, and that's why we do very badly. So uh, to, uh, to reinforce, 77% of ovarian cancer symptoms are actually abdominal and gastrointestinal, and only less than a quarter of women have uh, pelvic symptoms. This is a, a, a paper we published in Lancet, and I coined the term um, uh, the empress of subterfuge for ovarian cancer because, uh, because it's not ovarian cancer, it is fallopian tube cancer. And, and while you keep concentrating on the ovary and looking for an ovarian enlargement, there's disease all over. This is a patient with very early uh, uh, ovarian cancer or fallopian tube cancer who actually presented with uh, malapropism, which is, uh, she was perfect, no abdominal symptoms, no other symptoms, but just had a speech problem. And that's because she, the, uh, she developed a paraneoplastic syndrome and uh, a vegetation in the heart, which then caused multiple emboli in the brain and uh, uh, infarcted her um, kidney, et cetera. So this is a disease that spreads very, very early and very fast before imaging or our standard tumor markers can detect it. So um, uh, given that uh, imaging is not very useful, what can you do now as uh, uh, practicing clinicians? And really it's to remember that uh, ovarian cancer in the vast majority of cases is actually fallopian tube cancer, that to take vague abdominal symptoms and constitutional symptoms in a postmenopausal woman, de novo symptoms in a postmenopausal woman seriously. And just because an ultrasound, endovaginal ultrasound is normal, not to forget that ovarian cancer may be a problem. And to then ask for a serial CA125. So annual screening for ovarian cancer using CA125 and endovaginal ultrasound scan is a waste of time. As I showed you, that we have level one evidence, but that does not mean that these tests are not important. Please remember, if you have an older relative, if you have patients, if you have anyone who has vague constitutional symptoms, um, abdominal symptoms, a CA125 is a very inexpensive test. Uh, in Canada, it costs $12. I don't know how, how much. So just add it. I uh, do talks to general surgeons, to our ER physicians, to general practitioners to say in, in among all the uh, money you spend investigating uh, for all sorts of weird and wonderful diseases in an older perimenopausal, postmenopausal woman who comes to you with vague symptoms, please add on a CA125 and then repeat it in five or six weeks. And if it's rising re relentlessly, even if it's not very high, uh, please think of ovarian cancer because this is a, a really a great pretender. Now, where does endometrial cancer come in in, uh, in terms of uh, causing deaths and morbidity? It is the most common gynecological cancer. The vast majority of endometrial cancer, about 70% are well-behaved endometrioid adenocarcinoma, but about 15% are the high-grade uh, subtypes. About 10% is high-grade serous endometrial cancer. And these 15% are responsible for almost half the deaths of endometrial cancer. Why? Because the cells from the endometrial cavity 
behave exactly like cells from the fallopian tube. These high-grade serous cells go along the fallopian tubes while the endometrium is still thin before the women has started bleeding or having any other problems. If they slip out through the uh, fallopian tubes and go all over the peritoneal cavity and, and spread. And that is why 80% of um, um, these patients present to us with advanced disease. So given this challenge, uh, and given that uh, our traditional imaging blood tumor markers were not going to work, what could we do? And that's when uh, we came up with the genomic uterine pap test. And why? Why the genomic uterine pap test? And that is because the earliest step in ca carcinogenesis is mutations, somatic mutations. So if we could detect somatic mutations in a pap test, that may be a good way of finding out these cancers early before they go through the fallopian tubes and spread all over the peritoneal cavity. So uh, I first um, teamed up with um, Dr. Bert Vogelstein from Johns Hopkins and his team. And last year, we published in Science Translational Medicine, where we looked at uh, a cervical pap test as well as endometrial pap test to see whether looking for somatic mutations in these would uh, lead to the early diagnosis. And we did have uh, some encouraging results, okay? The intra, the cervical pap test was less useful. It picked up 81% of endometrial cancers and 33% of ovarian cancer. But the moment you took, took the pap test from inside the uterus, the endometrial cancer detection rate went up and the ovarian cancer detection rate also went up. It's still not brilliant, but it did go up. And so, that is what I have been investing, my team and I, and uh, uh, Laurie's here, who uh, she's helping me with the slides and so on and so forth. But we have invested heavily in trying to uh, optimize this genomic pap test. Okay, so what we do is we started off using a G 18 gene panel. Uh, of genes that are implicated in ovarian and endometrial cancer and to identify mutations in these genes. We have now, and we use uh, next generation sequencing or massive parallel sequencing to detect these mutations. Uh, we have continued to work on it and we have now added a, a, a few more genes and now we are working with the 23 gene panel. Uh, I have a very big and experienced team working with me. We have um, epidemiologists, um, uh, molecular geneticists, uh, um, bioinformaticians, uh, a whole team, um, but also mechanical engineering team from McGill has joined up with me. And the reason for that is, if you will recall, I said that if a pap test is taken from inside the uterus, the detection rate is higher. But if we go into the uterus, it's more painful for women. So this is a, a new device we uh, um, discovered or pay, and we have patented it. And it is, it has a, it's very tiny. It's only about uh, less than a millimeter here. And it, it, uh, it's an OS finder and a, um, a liquid biopsy specimen uh, to uh, take uh, together. So you put it into the uterus and then you open up this a Chinese lantern, like a very, very fine, flimsy um, uh, collect, 
product collection device and it doesn't strip the endometrium. It's not like a pipel. It just takes the fluid and the exfoliated cells and we put it into a, um, a, a buffer and it's stable at room temperature. So I'm pleased to say that this April, uh, 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 we succeeded in getting a 6.24 million grant from Genome Canada and Genome Quebec. Uh, I'm glad that it was uh, announced just before COVID hit us. Um, really, the next day the hospital closed down. This is the Minister for Industry, Canadian Minister for Science and Industry. This is our CEO. This is from Gina, representative from Genome Canada. This is from Genome Quebec. And, uh, and uh, we will uh, start our phase three trial with these funds in um, uh, hopefully when the worst of COVID is over, we, uh, we have put a start date for the 1st of um, October if we don't have a second wave of COVID here. And, um, uh, to, um, and hopefully this will give us a genomic pap test, which all of us can have, and we will put it in the public. That's why we are using um, uh, public funds to develop it, because we want this available to everybody. And, um, and so watch the space. So to summarize, most deaths from ovarian cancer are caused by high-grade serous cancer. Most high-grade serous cancers start in the fallopian tube. CA125 and transvaginal ultrasound scan should not be used to screen for high-grade serous cancer. Um, um, it, it often causes vague abdominal pain and constitutional pain before gynecological symptoms because of the nature of the spread. Uh, don't forget to uh, use serial CA125 in uh, older symptomatic women. It's not very expensive and may point you towards ovarian cancer. Endometrial cancer, again, uh, it's, there's uh, the high-grade subtypes exfoliate and spread while the primary cancer is very small. And, and before it may ca uh, cause significant bleeding or your transvaginal ultrasound scan is abnormal. Um, so I've said that. This is my team. Um, uh, I'm supported by very many, many uh, people. These are my uh, gynae oncology colleagues, Dr. John and Dr. Zhang. And this is, uh, these are our nurses and our um, uh, researchers. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, ma'am. It was amazing work and an amazing talk. I hope you remember you had come to Manipal and given us a, a talk and there you showed your skills uh, in uh, robotics. Yeah, do you remember that? Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, we, uh, you, uh, I mean, uh, we have a very busy surgical uh, division too. And thank you for giving me the opportunity at that time to come and speak about our, uh, our robotics. Yeah, we always look forward to your coming. I had visited Quebec, but that time we could not meet up actually. Uh, yeah. So I thank, that's the end of our uh, today's program dot nine o'clock we are just still one minute away from nine o'clock we started sharp 6 30 and we are now closing at a sharp nine o'clock one minute left for the nine o'clock actually and i thank every one of uh, you for uh, making this a very uh, very useful and memorable uh, oration this year we were really wondering whether this would go off well or not because of this covid online thing coordinating so many things I would again thank, though Akila has formally given the vote of thanks, I would like to thank again Dr. Girija, Dr. Shubhagita for actually roping in you and Dr. Urmila. And later only I took over and did all the other things. And um, I thank Amit Arvin, who has been actually like a pillar. He gave us so many trials to you, to me, to Urmila and Amti Namar. This afternoon I was actually again panicking. So he just gave a trial to me and my wife. My wife was monitoring what I would do. And uh, so thanks a lot. And everybody cooperated very well. I am really thankful once again. 
I request Dr. Pratap sir to come and uh, give his comments, final comments. He's our senior most person in the department. He's the guiding light uh, for all of us. He has been actually guiding all of us uh, and we have been trained by him to do this kind of meticulous work. So, sir, are you there? Yeah, of course, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, ovation and the talk is wonderful by Corbin and Lucy. It's been a great experience to listen to these uh, experienced people, I should say. And uh, Lucy, you were great. I remember all, of all my classmates. Uh, all my classmates, some of them are listening to you right now, Lucy. Okay. Right. And then uh, Urmila, you have been a, uh, it's a wonderful, uh, it's a lot of good work too. And I should, uh, I appreciate Dr. Mulidhar Pai for his meticulous, uh, you know, the planning he's been doing for so many weeks about all these kind of things. And then Muli, a great uh, big clap for you, right? Thank you and very he's much. He's so sir. meticulous, very meticulous. He's told all of us what to do, what not to do. And then, of course, Girija, a big hand to you. And Shubhagita, another big hand. And Jay Gauri, you're always there for us, big hand. Uh, I'm so happy that Dr. Krishna Rao could join us in this. Uh, uh, big namaskar to you, sir. And great, great evening. And I'm sure uh, we can switch on the video now. All of us, we can see each other. The official program is over. And all you people who are in the program, switch on the video. Let me see you, who all are there. Yeah. Right? Okay. Murli. So, uh, thank you, sir. And uh, as sir was suggesting that we can have Amit, we can... Uh, Go some more time, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Oh, because any, we, any we, yeah. we abruptly stopped everybody communicating with each other at 6.25 because yes, I wanted to stop exactly at 6.30 <laughs> because uh, I've learned this punctuality from both Madam and Dr. Pratap. Yeah, uh, sir. And uh, so 6.30, we started exactly 9 o'clock, we finished. I'm so happy about that. So now we can go for another uh, half an hour or more, I think, uh, chatting with each other. So switch on all audios and all videos so we can meet and greet everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Lucy, for you. coming online. Yeah. Uh, Pratap, I wanted to say you truly were uh, were my favorite classmate. I hope nobody else takes offense to that. No, no, no. <laughs> thank so, you so much. Thank, uh, so uh, thank you and thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to your department. And Murli, when you're here next time, uh, please, please, please. I uh, most of the time, unfortunately, I am very, very, very busy. And I can but that. this, as I grow older, I know how wonderful it is uh, to keep in touch with all of you. And uh, you know, nothing uh, replaces a friendship and uh, our net social networks. Yeah. So um, I hope next uh, year. I, we, I can recruit one more person to our department and things will ease for me. I've been trying to do well, that for that a while. Time you must make a trip. Hopefully by that time COVID also will 